welcome to the Clock and Talk. I'm your host, Tez, and thank you for downloading. Thank you for listening. Um, this week, we haven't got Schwinn with us, so it's just me and Tony. Hello, buddy. Yeah, I'm good. I'm slowly getting rid of you lot one by one. Next week, it'll just be a Clock and Talk with Tony. <laughs> um, i got no comment. i got no comeback <laughs> on that. <laughs> um, okay, let's get straight into the game, mate. Uh, Milan, second leg. Uh, 3-1, was it a scoreline you thought that we'd come out with? Uh, I knew there'd be, well, I mean, judging by what I saw, like from the lineups and stuff, I knew there'd be goals in it because they obviously knew they needed to, to get goals to get back into the game and, and they played in that way that, I mean, I thought they were tactically quite bad. It's not what I would have done if I was them, but it, it I mean, there was clearly going to be goals in it from from the way they, they set up. It was a, it was a line-up. We went in strong and uh, didn't look like Wenger was going to risk any any uh, repercussions or comebacks. So a line-up you thought was pretty strong? It, I think, it, I mean, you could argue about checking Ospina, but you know Ospina's going to play in the Cup. So beyond that, I thought it was the strongest he had available. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to get into the Welbeck penalty straight up. Um I don't know about you, you there, but over here there was a bit of controversial. Um, first of all, did you think it was a penalty? Uh, at the time, and I'm kind of at the other end of the ground, um, I thought it was. Um, I thought it looked like, from as I said, the other end of the ground, um, that, like, do you know when you're running and someone runs into the back of your legs? Like, they haven't particularly tried to make a tackle, but they have impeded you. Mm. Um, that's what it looked like from the other end and, and we was all sort of convinced everyone around me like I said I don't speak to everyone individually but you, the way the way everyone was shouting for it and stuff yeah everyone was, was pretty sure um, then when I looked at half time at Twitter and every, some people at first were just saying oh it was a bit soft and then others were saying it was a clear dive uh, and then I watched it back last night and it, yeah it's never a penalty in a million years yeah he was uh, <laughs> he was very lucky but uh, as I said a couple of my mates you know like uh, some you get, some you you know, some you give, some you some you lose. So it's it's one of them things, isn't it? Like, um, yeah, you could say he dived. Uh, you could say he went down. He got the penalty, but you know, uh, if that was to happen against us, we'd be up in arms. So I, I get the catch twenty two as well. You know, like um, for me, it wasn't a penalty, but it was just unlucky for my arm. <laughs> I don't. I don't really know what to say about it. Um, no, I think you just got it. It was a. It wasn't a penalty. Um, it was a dive. It's just, there's no. Like, I'm not going to change what I would normally say because it's an Arsenal player that done it. It was a dive. Did I celebrate getting the penalty? Yes. Did I celebrate him scoring it? Yes. Is it a dive? Yes. Yeah. But the amount of times that we have players in the box, and to be honest, as a fan, I'm shouting "Go down!" under pretty much any contact because that's what happens in football. Obviously, there was no contact there, which probably oversteps a mark, but, I mean, look, I'm not particularly bothered by it. We've seen it happen enough against us, and we've seen it happen for us before. I think people are just making too big a deal out of it. I'm not condoning it, but I'm not going to start saying that, like, start hammering Danny for it, because it's what happens in football now, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, when we when Milan took the first goal, I think it was the 35th minute or something, uh you know, and we, we obviously come back in that 39th with that penalty. Um, your initial reaction when we went down 1-0? Um, barring, barring their chance after about 30 seconds, I didn't think they threatened at all uh, until the goal. So I wasn't, I wasn't overly worried because it wasn't, it, I mean, it wasn't a chance they scored. He's hit it from 30-something yards out. It was a great hit. Mm. Uh, I've seen people blaming Ospina up. I didn't. I definitely didn't at the time, and having seen it back, I still don't. Um, I think they've just it's because it's Ospina. Um, he's been criticised, but for me, it wasn't Ospina's fault. But no, I wasn't too worried just because it wasn't like they were creating chances and then scored, and it looked like they were going to carry on. They'd scored from nothing and, and hadn't created anything, barring, as I said, the first forty seconds when we were just showed so shocked by their tactics um, of leaving four up that as soon as one ball went in behind, we were struggling. Uh, but after that, once we, we figured out what they were doing, um, they didn't create anything. So the goal, 
didn't set panic in the way it probably would have done another time. Mm-hmm. Um, 45th minute, Montreal, he gets a yellow card. Um, your take on that? Ridiculous. That was a ridiculous decision. It was literally it's because he would he had got um, he got booking happy with their players for arguing that. I mean, you know, I don't know if this is only at the game, but obviously I'm at the games. But you get a feel when a player is going to get booked from the way the the game's going. And we knew that the next time an Arsenal player gave away a foul, they was going to get booked. Um, but I mean, before just before that, there was the, the Chambers potential handball incident. I, I don't think it was. Um, I've not really seen anyone speak about it. So I don't think anyone think it was. Hmm. But... There was a chance of them getting that just because of the pressure they put on, and he'd just given one to us that he didn't. The ref didn't want to give. It was the assistant that gave it. The geezer behind the goal with a wand. Um, so I was quite surprised that that wasn't given. To be honest. Yeah, I, I didn't make mention of it because I agree with you. I don't think there was much in it. So, um, I, but I have I haven't looked back at it either. Um, I did look back at the penalty, and I I watched Shaka's goal. <laughs> About ten times, and I had a little <laughs> over it. So, <laughs> um, but mate, I didn't. I didn't really take much notice of the Chambers handball. Um, so you're probably the one I might have missed that one actually. Yeah, no, I said I, I don't think it was, but it's just given that the, the way the game, like the situation in the game, and, and I know quite a few referees um, that have worked not in Europe, but they've worked sort of in the in the Premier League or they've been an assistant in the Premier League or they've worked in the championship and I my my when I talk to them um I always say my biggest complaint with referees is they they bend the rules to suit the situation. Mm-hmm. And they all admit it. They say obviously we're not supposed to, but yeah, that's what happens. Um and in that situation I'm so very surprised he didn't give a penalty. Not I don't think it was a penalty. Yeah. But as I said they ref on situations, not on on the rule book. Um, since you brought up Chambers when he come on you like what you're saying um, I came out of the ground thinking he played very very well and then I thought about a few chances they had where there was just no one anywhere near their players and I can't particularly put the blame on Chambers for it but if they've got a striker free in the area and it wasn't just once it was a few times then you've kind of got to think, well, it's someone's fault. So, I mean, because we don't man mark, you don't know individually whose fault it is. But the fact is there was three, there were strikers standing unmarked in our box. So you've got to, you've got to blame someone. Um, and as I said, it's not that I'm blaming Chambers, but you've got to look at, I've got to bring his, uh, like whatever I would rate him out of 10 down a bit, just because their striker was free in the middle a few times. Hmm. I don't want to take anything away from the Milan um, performance, like, but they did go down five, one over two legs. Um, I, if I was a Milan, and I know we're an Arsenal podcast, but a couple of Milan fans out there, what's your thoughts of, um, what is it, Gattuso? Because I personally was watching to see what he was actually trying to do, especially in that second leg. I, I thought he may have had a couple of tricks up his sleeve, but... He didn't really seem to come out and challenge us. Um, what was your take on it? I mean, I, I would have done it differently, but what he tried to do is he, they pretty much, especially in the first half, they left four up at all times, which kind of stopped our fullbacks going forward. And it's where the, the Andre Silva chance after 40 seconds, because we wasn't set up for it, the ball went in behind Monreal, and they were four on three, which is why Andre Silva was... was free um and he probably should have done better hit the side netting but after that chance it gave us a, it gave we sort of figured out what they were going to do and i mean it's, it's sort of like he went all out to try and get back in the game as soon as possible whereas i would have if i was him uh just played a normal game for half an hour or maybe the first half and see where you're at reassess mm. um I mean, it was abundantly clear after five minutes of that game. I, I said to the like, the bloke sitting next to me that there is going to be goals. There's going to be a lot of goals in this game. We've just got to hope that they don't get two more than us because they were so attacking and so open that it, there was going to be goals. There was no way there wasn't going to be goals. Um, but I, I personally think Gattuso went too gung-ho 
and he should have, as I said, just played normal football and reassess after 30 minutes to 45 minutes because you could just be playing normally and be 1-0 up at half-time. And then again, you can you can go to the next 20 to 25 minutes of the second half just playing normally and then reassess where you're at. But where if you go gung-ho straight away, the game could have been over within 20, 30 minutes. Well, they played um, the first league against us, and as you know, look, everyone knows they lost that one. They are still undefeated in the uh, league. They played the game, I can't remember who they played, but they beat them last week. And then they yeah, come, they won 1-0, Andre Silva scored in the last minute. Yeah, and then they come out against us this week, and they must be thinking, oh, well, look, maybe it was a bad, bad performance that first week. They seem to be getting everything, and I know the game's dead and buried and they've moved on, but so I don't really want to go over it too much, but they almost seem like um, they've got the league games down pat, but when it comes to Arsenal, I, I don't know if, are we actually a class above them? I mean, look, I don't watch any Italian football, as I've said before, so I, I don't know, but everyone tells me about how great Milan's running power is, and they didn't look like they were outrunning us, and we were just so much better with the ball that it didn't matter even if they were outrunning us. We just had too many options. Also, I mean, I don't know in how many games and whatnot, but Cutrone has got 14 goals this season. And he didn't look like he was going to score in a month for Sundays in either game. Mm. So you've got to look at what sort of quality they're playing against. I, I don't know, but I mean, they didn't show me anything over two legs that would make me think they've been, I, was, I think it's 14 games unbeaten in the league and, and league and cup in Italian games. And they haven't conceded, I think, for seven or eight games in a row. And I didn't see anything um, in either leg that would suggest that was likely. Mm -hmm. Um, I have to give a shout-out. El Nenny come on in the 69th minute. Mkhitaryan went off. Um, Your your thoughts on El Nenny? I I I personally think he had a good game again. Uh, I just thought he was steady. I don't think there's anything to to shout about. I don't think there's anything to criticise. Uh, I thought it was the right sub and not because Mkhitaryan played bad, but we was in the first half, we was quite compact. And I think it was because we were shocked by that, not a fast start, but by the aggressive start that they made. So we was quite compact. And then in the second half, for some reason, we opened the game up when, to be honest, it was probably the last thing we needed. I know we ended up winning it 3-1 and I've seen loads of people praising our attacking intent, but I'm not saying we should have parked the bus, but we were so open it was like there was no midfield from either side. It was end to end. It was like a game of FIFA. Um, and I said, I know some people have praised that, but I don't think that's really what the game required. Um, so El Nenny was the right sub. And as I said, it's not because Mkhitaryan was bad. It was just he was an extra body to sit in the middle. Mm. But yeah, I don't think he'd done anything spectacular. Uh, but again, he, he definitely didn't do anything bad. It was a good, solid performance. I'll, pro- I'll probably come back on the with the El Nenny in a minute regarding the last goal. We may have a bit of differences on it. Um, but w- before we talk about that, uh, Shaka he scored in the 71st minute. Uh, classic Shaka um, does what he does. Has them long shots. A lot of people say at times we don't like Shaka shooting long. I personally, I think I've said it here before, I personally like it. Um, have a stab, have a gamble. However, I will criticise the Milan goalkeeper because that was a big mistake. Yeah, to be honest, I think from Donnarumma, it's one of them things that he couldn't do that if he tried. I actually don't know how that's happened. He's palmed it in front of him and it's ended up spinning backwards. Hmm. Um, It's terrible from him. I mean, he should be holding that. And then even if he doesn't, he should be pushing it away. It wasn't a good hit from from Granite. Um, I think... And it sh- I think Donnarumma done it in the end of the first half with a shot from Jack. I think he dived so far to cover the corners that anything that's not good or not great, he struggles with, which is weird. You think he struggles with the easier shots, but he made a very good save in the first half from Ramsey that was going in the corner. Um, and I said, I think he, li- he lunges so far to try and cover the whole goal that he struggles when the, when the shot isn't as good. Um, but yeah, I don't, to be honest, I said no when Granite lined up to shoot just because of the situation. I don't mind him shooting from distance, but he didn't really have a run-up. There was no stride, so he was never going to get his normal power. Mm. And I have no issue with shooting from distance, but I just advocate taking the best option, which I don't think he did in that in that situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but it's gone in. I'm not, I'm not going to moan, but I, 
I was one of the people that, as he, as he lined up to hit it, I, I said no, and I'll be open and honest about that. Um, Donnarumma, he, uh, what? It, um, I, look, he's he's been linked with a move away from Milan. You've seen 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 him play two legs now. Would he be? Sorry? You've seen him play um, the, two, the two games. Would he be one that you'd want at Arsenal, and at what price? Well, uh, I mean, he's going to be whatever if he moves, which I don't. I probably don't think he will. But saying that they've got financial troubles, it's going to be for crazy money. I mean, you got to look at keepers; they tend not to, to mature till they're quite old. And obviously, nineteen. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you're looking at arguably twenty years of service from him if someone gets him for, for, to keep. Um, I've, look, I've, I, there's a lot of improvement to be done. And for that sort of money that you'd have to pay for him, I wouldn't be looking for someone that you can improve. Um, so you want someone I mean, now, for me, yeah, for, for that kind of for the money they're going to be wanting, it'll be a world record fee for a keeper unless De Gea moves this summer. I mean, it's like if they both move this summer, which is possible, he would cost more than Courtois, mm. probably nearly double the amount, probably. And I know what one I'd rather. Mm-hmm. Try Butler in the mix. Again, Butler would be half the price. And for me, as of now, he he may be a little bit worse than, than Donnarumma. I wouldn't put much in it, and a lot of people would probably hammer me for that. But I don't think there's much difference between a Donnarumma and a, and a Butler at the moment. And again, Butler would probably be half the price. I'm, I'm not a... Not, I mean, I like Butler. I don't know if I'd have him as... Not, I wouldn't pay forty million for Butland, which is probably what you're going to have to do. Mm. But, but yeah, I don't see anything from Donnarumma that that makes me think he's better. He doesn't look. I mean, he didn't leave his line at all from crosses. I know we barely crossed the ball. Uh, his shot stopping is good, but it, as I said, he dies for the corners, which makes anything, which means he will make some unbelievable saves. But he'll also struggle with when the ball's not as good. Uh, his kicking didn't look fantastic. Um, as I said, there, there's a lot of work to be done, and, and obviously at 19 he has scary potential. But for but 70 or 80 right, million, that's a no. Yeah, no. As I said, I wouldn't be paying 80 million for for potential, I'd, mm. because you never know if that's gonna that's gonna come like he's gonna reach that potential. Mm, big gamble. Um, okay, so Ozil went off. Uh, I think that was pretty much routine in the 79th minute. Klozenach came on for a little run. Uh, well, they they went to they uh, stuck an extra man up front, so we went to the back five. Yep. Okay, that was in the 79th minute, and I missed this one, but I did watch it on replay. Uh, <laughs> it bounced all around the place. Uh, the 86th minute, where Welbeck. Um, Put it in finally to make it three one. I said earlier a bit of controversial because I thought the whole play basically started from El Nini, and you said earlier I don't think he did much. I didn't say he didn't do much. I said he wasn't spectacular. It was a very yeah. good ball from El Nini, but it was it was a thirty yard ball into a striker's feet. It's a ball I would expect him to make if he'd have over hit that or under hit that. I'd, Again, it wouldn't have made me think he had a terrible performance, but it, I would say, oh, that's a ball I expect him to make. Mm, okay. um, it was a good ball, but as I said, uh, I think had he overhit that by five yards, people would have been moaning. Mm. Um, it was good vision to see him. As I said, it's not... But, I mean, you've got to look. You got, and that, look the move started from that, but then there was oh, one more the pass, Jack, and then the Jack. Jack beat a man, crossed it, yeah. and then a header, and then a save, and then another header. So, yeah. you can't... Act the goal down to that pass but it was a good ball mm-hmm. okay um, who was your man of the match um, very very close between Granite and Danny which it was in the away leg as well um, I would go Granite um, but again I've seen people hammering Welbeck um, and I don't think they understand what they're watching because he was excellent again but I think Granite, just position-wise, he controlled the game. But the amount of times that Danny ran the channels, 
um, even Granite's goal came from Danny running the channel, winning it, and he won a header and it got blocked, and then he passed it wide. So I think Ramsey around then and I'm not saying he contributed. I'm not saying he had a big contribution in the goal, but with someone that isn't willing to run the channels with the, the work rate and power and pace that he possesses, that goal doesn't happen. Mm. Um, and I mean, there was Danny. Done, I thought Danny done really well in the first half when he got a shot off that Donnarumma made a save from. He done really well from a cut back from a cross to when Mkhitaryan headed just wide and he also started that move by winning the ball on the opposite flank I thought he had an excellent performance but again people look at Danny Welbeck misplacing the pass or having a bad touch and, and think that automatically makes him a bad player but I think Granite controlled the game so I'd go for Granite I'm often pretty quick to criticise Welbeck and uh, Bambi on ice because the guy just look he, he's a great runner but when it comes to them little little one touch, you know, with the ball and and creating something. But then again, he, he is a striker as well. Um, it's more what. Oh, no, as I said, as I said to Schwinn, like the thing is, we, we get caught up in beautiful football, especially as Arsenal fans. But Welbeck, once you realise what he's good at, there's there's actually a lot to rate about him. The thing is, we rate him on on his worst aspect. And I know, as I said, as a footballer, being good at football is is a big aspect, but. Mm. We, we only rate him on our first aspects. And I, and I said to Schwinn before, that, I mean, it's a famous Einstein quote, that if you if you rate a goldfish on its ability to climb a tree, you're always going to think it's useless. And yeah. that's how I see Welbeck. If you rate him on his footballing one, first touch and, and probably finishing ability, you think, oh, this guy can't play. Suddenly you start looking at pace, power, how annoying he is for defenders because he can beat them in many ways. He's either going to be quicker than them, stronger than them, better in the air, or willing to run the channels. When you start looking at that, you think, fuck me, this guy's got quite a lot to offer. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem with Danny. He has a lot to offer. One of them, one of them isn't goal-scoring ability, unfortunately. And that seems to be one of, one of the things that p- people only look at. But I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to play against him. And mm-hmm. I can guarantee you, and this isn't a dig at Lacazette, a, a, a centre-back would rather play against Lacazette than Danny Welbeck. 100%. Mm-hmm. Just... What his runs just trouble the defenders? You think? Well, as I said, as I said, he's either going to outrun them, and if there's a centre back that's quicker than him, there's not going to be many, but there might be be some. Danny's probably going to be stronger than them, and if he's not, it'll be better than them in the air. And if he's worse at all three of them things, which is very very unlikely, he's going to go and stand out on the wing, and then he's going to give you fullback nightmares because he's definitely going to be better than your fullback in at least one of them three areas, if not two or all three of them areas. Mm. So suddenly it's like, well, I'd better go out there and help my help my fullback because my fullback's getting bullied. So then you get a centre back going over to fullback and the middle of the pitch empty. Whereas Lacazette is technically a much better player, but it's a gentle day for a defender. He's not going to outrun you. He's not going to beat you in the air. He's not going to outstrength you. Yeah, he'll play nice link up play and his finishing is a lot better, but that doesn't make him harder to play against. As I said, you'll come off the pitch after playing against Danny Welbeck, knowing you've been in the game. Whereas Lacazette, he could score, but the centre back thinks, "Well, I've not really had to work today." Mm-hmm. I look, and I, like I said, I was just about to say I, I often do criticise Welbeck, but I actually think he had a good game, and um, my man of the match will go to Granite um, Shaka. But Welbeck, I, I agree with you; he was he was there close. Um, each week we've been doing an Ozil watch. Um, big game. This was a big game. Uh, a lot of people would say that. He went missing in this game. Personally, I think he he passed. What what was your take on Ozil? Uh, if anyone that thinks he went missing don't know what they're watching and take up basketball or something else, I'm not saying he was exceptional, but his job is to create chances. And I saw a figure as I was driving home. I saw on Twitter someone someone said he'd gone missing, and someone else said, "What are you on about? He created six chances, which was the most in the match by a distance." Mm. And I thought. Like I, I thought he'd done okay, not brilliantly. Um, and I saw that stat and I thought, yeah, but six chances can be misleading. And when I watched the highlights last night, they, three of them, at least three of them, were very good chances he created. It's not like he gave the ball... Like Whoever got the assist for Xhaka's goal will be credited with creating a chance. But for me, that's not a chance. I think it was Ramsey. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Mm. But I thought, I right, if they've given Ozil six, they've credited him with creating six chances, but they were like that then that's not, I mean, that counts for nothing in my mind. But when I saw the chances, um, two were slipped to Ramsey at the edge of the box. One Donnarumma made a really good save from, as I mentioned earlier. The other one, Ramsey should have scored or done a lot better when he got taken out by Barini after he'd hit the shot into the upper tier. 
And then he played Mkhitaryan in wide for a one-on-one. Mkhitaryan shot first time poorly. He should have had another touch and would have scored. Um, so, I mean, there are three big chances that, that Ozil created. So anyone that thinks he's gone missing, I, I don't know what they want from him. They want him to go and beat Temple. If, if the players would have done their job better and he got assists, then they'd be, they'd be going, oh, Ozil was amazing. He got three assists. Mm. But what he done, quality, if the players didn't finish it off, you can't blame him for that. No. And this uh, is why, like I say, we'll try and do a bit of a watch because I, I personally think he had a he had a good game. Yeah, he, he didn't – there was no – I don't think there was any assists by Ozil. Um, but you look at the stats, he's, and this is one of them games that – he he hasn't got the best stats, but if you actually watched your game, and I'll use your your phrase, watch football with your eyes, you'll actually see he he did have a pretty good game. Yeah, as I said, I don't think he was exceptional, but to say I went missing or didn't play well is is a joke. Like, as I said, you just I, I don't know what people think they're watching. Yeah. Oh, his body language was bad at times, and he maybe didn't track back. And I know people would moan, and I moaned about when they had a chance um, from him not jumping. There was a long ball played to him and he just completely ducked out of the way and, and they won the ball and they had a good chance from it. Cutroni volleyed it wide. But that that one moment doesn't make it a bad game in the same way one one good moment when you've been terrible doesn't make it a good game. A couple of times I noticed him drifting back a little bit too deep more than what I would have liked him being. Um, but obviously Ramsey was on that side. Uh, Ramsey, as we know, likes to run through and attack. Jack played in the in the number ten position in behind Welbeck um, with Mkhitaryan on the left. Is that the type of setup you'd like going forward? Um, I, I've always had my grievances with Jack as a ten. Uh, I've never been a big fan. It means we control the ball very well, but it relies so much on Ramsey. And I'm not saying that Ramsey isn't someone that can be relied upon, but if they stop Ramsey in that system, it becomes very, very difficult to, to create anything. And especially if teams drop off and just let us have the ball. The, the joy of that, of that team is that all of them are quite good on the ball. Mm. And when another team are trying to get it, we can keep it quite comfortably and pass and move and outplay them. But when you come to play these teams, like, for example, our next game is Stoke at home. Stoke will have 10 men behind the ball and say, go on then, have the ball. When that's the situation, you don't need that quality in there because they're giving up the ball. They're letting you have it. Um, So, I mean, for me, that team works in a certain situation. And both legs against Milan were were that situation. But as I said, if you're going to, you know Danny's going to start running channels, then... um, it leaves the middle of the pitch empty and you're just so reliant on Ramsey. And as I said, if they stop Ramsey, then I can't really see how you're going to score. I mean, even looking at, looking at yesterday's goals, obviously the penalty, which shouldn't have been a penalty. Second goal is a long shot, a huge mistake from the, from the keeper. And the third one, again, relied on Ramsey getting in the middle. Mm. Yeah. He missed his header, but Welbeck got the rebound, but all of the goal and all of most of our other chances you can think of, if you look where Ramsey was, he was either on the end of them or the guy in the middle of the pitch because Welbeck was running the channels. Mm, mm. So I think that system just so heavily relies on Ramsey, and if he's stopped, we're we're gonna we're gonna struggle. Do you swap Jack and Ramsey, or how do you fix that? Uh, no. Uh, uh, to be honest, I mean, for me, you fix it by probably not playing all three of them. And that's that's a, a team for big games for me, because mm. um, as I said, you're going to be wrestling for possession of the ball. Um, I wouldn't swap Jack and Ramsey because Ramsey's biggest biggest strength for his, is probably his energy and he's late arriving late in the box. Yep. Whereas if he's at 10, he's never going to be arriving late in the box because he's expected to be there. Yeah, and you take away his energy because if he starts running box to box, then you've got no one at 10. Hmm. So uh, for me, I wouldn't swap them around. As I said, I think that's a, that's a, a team for bigger games. Um, but for the smaller ones, I just wouldn't play that 11. Mm, okay, um, Monreal he copped a little bit of criticism. Uh, I've noticed uh, a lot of people saying well, he just wasn't there uh, with yellow as well. But as we discussed earlier, it probably wasn't a fair, fair yellow anyway. Um, his performance last night or yesterday? I, I don't think um, I don't think there's it's fair to criticise any player from yesterday's performance. I don't look. Was Monreal excellent? No. Was he bad? Definitely not. Mm. Um, 
for me, it was just another, another. But I mean, that's what Nacho tends to be. He gets a seven or eight every week. He rarely excels, but he's rarely bad. He is Mister Consistent, and I'd say yesterday was probably a seven rather than an eight. But that don't make that don't make it bad. And said he got caught out early on because, but the whole team got caught out. It came down his side, so you can you can see where the blames leveraged at him. But as I said, the whole team were caught out. And then beyond that, I don't think he had any trouble with anything defensively. As I said, I think his booking was a joke. And beyond that, I can't remember anything else he'd done that where he was caught out. But then on the other hand, I can't remember anything he'd done where I thought, well, yeah, that's really good, Nacho. Mm-hmm. He was just there. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Just, just done his job. If I've got to criticise anybody, and, and like, I'm like you, I don't want to criticise anyone out of that game. It was a good win. It was 3-1. I'm, but, however, I'm not a fan of... Um, Bellerin making them them breaks up the wing and crossing in. I know it's an attacking option that we have, but it, for me it leaves leaves that back line a bit vulnerable um, on the counter. Well, I mean, you know, look, as much as I don't rate Bellerin, I often feel very sorry for him, sorry for him because we don't play anyone in front of him, so he's charged with doing the attacking and defending. And it isolates him when we get the ball as well because he gets the ball and there's never anyone in front of him to give the ball to. Mm. Um, and again, I, I definitely wouldn't say it was a bad performance from him. And I'm not his biggest fan, as everyone knows. But again, I thought it was just a performance, nothing wrong, nothing majorly right. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't nothing wrong with him. But uh, and he, I thought he was pretty good. But it's just I watch him run up that wing, and I think here we go again. We go, and then he crosses it in, and I think oh, fucking shit cross that was. Um, yeah, but I mean, you can't blame him for, for having to get forward. When we play no one wide on the right, which we don't, he, he's going to have to do that. And especially with Danny up front, and to a certain expe- extent, Aubameyang as well, but maybe not as much, that their favoured run, if they have to run a channel, tends to be on the left, so they can cut in on their right foot. Mm. Um, so Hector has to go forward, otherwise we'd be the most imbalanced team in football and would be so easy to defend against. Hmm, okay, so three one, fair result. Um any girls you want to talk about out of that match? Uh no, not really. Nothing I can think of. I'll just make a quick mention <laughs> that was Savvy who did the ratings. Um I disagree with a spooner. I, I thought he didn't do anything too too bad to I think Savvy rate a five or something, so uh five point five in the ratings, but I I don't think he was that bad. Um, no, as I said, I've seen some blaming for the goal. I, I personally don't think he did. He done nothing wrong beyond that. Uh, I thought his kicking was a lot better. A lot of people were moaning him for going short, but it's what we do. I don't think that's his fault particularly. Uh, no. And when he did go long, it's, it was quite accurate, which is quite unusual. Um, and he made... I mean, I think he only really had to make one save of no, and it was from Mustafi. Um, but he didn't make any mistakes. So, I mean, my heart was in my mouth when he flapped at that cross, but it was offside. But uh, yeah, I, I thought that was very harsh. I, don't, I didn't really understand where that rating come from. But as I said, everyone watches football differently. And I think uh, it's not always fair to, to argue with someone's opinion because it is just that. My opinion is different. Uh, I'd like to know the reasons why he gave a 5.5. But as I said, if that's what he saw, that's what he saw. Yeah, oh, yeah, look. Yeah. I, I'm not having a stab at Savvy. It was more, I just didn't agree with it, but um, each to their own as well. Um, okay, so Europa League, we've uh, drawn our, got our next team, uh, CSKA Moscow. Um, i already seen you're giving away tickets. <laughs> I'm not giving them away. <laughs> Selling tickets? Well, no, no one will buy them. No one's going to go. It'll be our lowest away crowd probably ever. Why is that? Too cold? Uh, cold, far, tensions between UK and Russia at the moment. Hmm. Okay, what are you talking about? I don't, know, I don't know if everyone knows this worldwide. I don't know what Actually, UK I just, current... I did hear something today with your... Yeah, well, I don't want to get politi- poly into politicians, but um, with your Prime Minister banging on about something because of the poison or something, wasn't it? Yeah, so an ex-Russian spy that basically, I think a few years ago, we'd done a spy swap. So we took theirs so, and whatever, but they had poisoned him and his daughter and he's been in hospital for the last week. And now they're pulling all their 
I don't know, the diplomats have all been banned from England or some shit. Mm. I'm not really on it, but there's tensions at the moment. So, And I think they've even put, said the Queen and a couple of others won't be going to the World Cup as well. No, so. no, it's the first time I think ever that there's been no royal family at the World Cup. Yeah. So, no fuck going there. Watch it on TV. <laughs> um, <laughs> What are we expecting? Uh, Europa League, uh, obviously going to expect a big, strong team. Um, this is a, ta- a competition we really want need to win now. Top four yeah, out the I window. Mean, yeah, I mean, I'd hope that we get it done in the home leg, but knowing Arsenal, we never do things that easy. Um, I don't know huge amounts about them. Um, they beat Leon, which um, Leon aren't the greatest, but, I mean, you're not going to beat Leon over two legs if you're shit. I'm not saying you have to be excellent, but I mean they're going to be able to to do a job. And they actually lost uh, at home and beat Leon away. Uh, beat Leon, I think three one away and one three two on aggregate. Or maybe it was three. No, uh, they sorry, I think they they won three two yesterday and went through on away goals. Um. So yeah, I mean they're going to be decent. Uh, I know I don't know how well he's doing, but I know Ahmed Musa's there who completely flopped in England. Um, but he scored yesterday but I mean he scored yesterday that might have been his first goal of the season I don't know I know their centre back They, I'm not sure if they're both still playing but they had the Ber- Berowski brothers one is still there um, okay. and he's ageing I mean he was ageing four years ago I don't know popping around on the Zimmer frame I think um, so if you can attack him with pace but as that's pretty much my knowledge of them Alan Zagoyev's a good player um, who plays at sort of like a number 10 for them but it's hard to know. As I said, I'm not going to pretend I watch Russian football. I can only judge on the few of their players that I know of. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I've got absolutely no idea. However, is that the team that I think Manchester United, a couple of fans said, a um, bunch of farmers or something? Is it that team? And they got beat? Uh, United, played, United played them in the Champions League groups. Yeah, and they got beat? I have no idea. Yeah, I thought... I, I vaguely thought that they beat, or, draw, or might have been a draw in the group stages, because um, obviously they bowed out at Moscow. But um, and they, the fans basically were calling them a bunch of farmers. So um, yeah, I mean, and it you know, I mean, I've just I've just grabbed that group up, and and they got nine points, um, which is no, which is it's like you're unlucky to go out with nine points, but then. Benfica got none, so obviously everyone beat them. Mm. And Basel got 12. So oh, nine Basel. points looks good, but coming behind Basel is probably not the best result. Yeah, might have been Basel. Okay. I, I know nothing about them. Um, wouldn't have a clue. Don't watch Russian football. We don't get it here. So I reckon we might be able to reach out to Putin during the week and see if he'll come on for an interview. Who? Putin. <laughs> oh, yeah, probably not. <laughs> um, okay, so we need to win this game. We need to go through to Europa League, and we need to win Europa League. Who's your danger in this tournament, mate? I mean, Atletico Madrid are strong favourites. Um, it's a bit annoying that they lost to Barcelona a few weeks ago because it means they're not fighting on the league front because they've got a very, very small squad, Atletico, especially mm. after selling Yannick Carrasco and Nico Gaetan. Um Yeah, that was crazy. So, yeah, um, and as I said, their squad's very small, but if they're only fighting on one front uh, in the same way that we are, then it's, I mean, it's annoying because they've only got they've only got one focus. Um, they also, they're going to qualify for the Champions League anyway, but still winning a trophy will be priority. But I'd imagine, I've not looked at the odds, but I'd imagine they're favourites and we're second favourites. I'd be very surprised if it's anything different than that. If they, and I'm just thinking out loud and a couple of other people are probably going to ask the same question. So The answer, the answer is no. Before you ask it, I know what you're going to ask. <laughs> well, I was, going to, I was going to say if they win the Europa League at Atletico Madrid, Arsenal come, obviously, if they're in the final, and yet Atletico Madrid go through, they make Champions League in their league, does that leave an option for Arsenal? No. I answered it before you asked it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, that's what I was going it to ask. It goes to the fourth placed in the next highest rated league, which I think is France. You're fucking kidding, aren't you? France. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, England, Italy, and Spain have got four. It might be Germany. Uh, if Germany don't have four already, 
We know Germany already have four. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's France. Okay. So there's no options for this. So we need to win this tournament. Yeah, you win it or shit or bust. Or no go. Okay, um, let's get into some user questions. As I stole from Mike from Gooners in the USA. So here, you and <laughs> user questions, you're going to love that. Um, you and Schwinn were doing it last couple of weeks when I wasn't here. You were just going one for one. You want to do that? Uh, let me put them up. You could have kind of prepped me for this. Yeah, I, I'm all over it. I, I looked like a fool last week, so. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll just, I'll, I'll eat you up with the first one while you're looking for it. Um, by Vish. Is there any credibility to the rumour of Arsenal willing to sell Bellerin next summer? I personally think it would be silly to do so. He's young and has not reached his full potential. He also sees seems much more effective recently with Mkhitaryan. Also, are we seriously in for Dembele? I haven't seen that one. Dembele. Um, yeah, so the football mole the other day tweeted that we're looking at Dembele or he's been offered to us or, or something. Um, actually, I'd seen someone on my timeline say just, something similar. Just I want Celtic, Dembele, or Barcelona? Oh, Barcelona. Oh, fuck, well, okay. Um, I'd seen someone say it on the timeline about three weeks ago, actually, that, that uh, Sven, obviously, who signed him for Dortmund, was looking at the possibility of getting him back because he hadn't been... I know he's been injured, but he hadn't had much playing time at Dortmund. And I read that and thought, yeah, there's absolutely no chance. And then the mole tweeted it a couple of days ago, and I still thought there's absolutely no chance. Um, question may have been asked. That that could be correct, but I, I can't see Barcelona letting him go. Um, in terms of Hector, um, it all depends on how much he wants to be at the club. Um, we know that he's flirted with moving before. I think if a reasonable... I, I, I remember one of our first podcasts, I kind of discussed this, where the big issue is replacement. There's a, a real lack of right-backs worldwide at the moment. So if you get offered 40, 45 million for Hector, I would usually say you're, you're stupid not to accept it. Mm. But it's who you replace them with. Forget forget their money. Even if money's no object, who do you replace them with? They're just... The, the ones that are are good enough and not gettable because they're already at your, your Real Madrid's or your, your Bayern Munich's. So even if money wasn't an, an object, just who's available? Mm. And you're looking at some that would be a huge gamble. I mean, uh, the, the guy from Napoli, Heisage, I think his name is pronounced. Um, it would be a huge gamble. There's just a, uh, Sidibe from Monaco is probably, again, a gamble, but a chance that he's available. But yeah, I just think it's a horrible position to replace. So it's a tough one because if that kind of money comes in, I, I would usually or I, I would probably accept it. But it's, it's who you get in to replace him. In terms of saying he's forged a partnership with Mkhitaryan, I mean, he hasn't. I know I, people <laughs> might might want to see that. But in reality, they've, the games they've actually played together in with the cup final, the City game, where we lost both. Oh, no, he didn't play in the cup final. But the City game where we lost 3-0. And the the Everton game, but Mkhitaryan played from the left. So, mm. I mean, I, I don't think there's any link of a partnership there. Quite As I said, so Mkhitaryan's much. Mkhitaryan's going to be very difficult to forge a partnership with anyway because. As I've said before, I'm still not sure if I like or dislike that. I have absolutely no idea where he's going to turn up uh, in terms of position wise. He seems to drift all over the place, which is is both a positive and a negative, but it does mean that you're not going to get any, any solid partnership with him and someone behind him. I'm just going to, Bellerin, um, if Barcelona are looking at Bellerin, I'd imagine it's Barcelona. Um, they're obviously thinking, well, there's not much options. So back to what you said, who do you replace him with? Yeah, well, that's the issue. I mean, as well, Barcelona have got to, I mean, how, how good they are is up for debate, but they, they spent about 30 million on Nelson Semedo in the, in the, uh, in the summer. And they've got, uh, is it Sergi Roberto that plays right back for them as well? Mm. So they've got, they've got two. Um, Barcelona always have a B in their bonnet about losing players, though. Um, 
like when they signed Fabregas back, I'm not saying he wasn't a great player, but they didn't really need him. But they have this beer, beer in their bonnet about losing players. It's more of a pride thing. So I wouldn't be surprised if they come back after Bellerin. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking who they got in their youth squad coming no, through the ranks. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not As I said, sure. they've got two anyway. They've got, like, Semedo was banned the other day against Chelsea. And I, I, I'm pretty sure it was Roberto, but I might be wrong. But whoever played um, against Chelsea the other day are right back. They're, they've got two players there. They mm. don't need Bellerin. That doesn't seem to matter with Barcelona. Mm-hmm. Um, you want another one? Well, you, yeah, you might as well answer this one from MWA Gunner because I've got no idea. Um, what's going on with Murdersecker? I, I mean, yeah, he said he's had, he's had mentally had issues with football, but over a long career, that's probably understandable. Um, it's not really been spoke about, but because football's a men's game and you're not affected by anything and there's no such thing as mental issues in football the same way as there's no apparently no gay footballers which there definitely is it's just these things aren't spoke about and now Mertesack is coming to the end of career he, he feels he can talk about it um, I don't think it's any reason why he's not in the squad I said after the Forest game I don't think he'll ever play for us again um, and I think he pretty much confirmed that in his in his interview after the game he may get a trot out at the end of the season as a, as a send off mm. last game of the season or last home game of the season bring him on for a bit or at least give him a lap on the pitch which he will do but in terms of what's happening with him I don't think it's any reason why he's not playing his focus is already on next year isn't it with the year partially and partially I think he just knows he's not at that level he's not at Premier League level anymore he's not at Mm. Arsenal first team level anymore so he's probably I'm assuming a very still a very good pro and still very good for the players behind the scenes but he knows his time's up as a player. Mm, okay. Um, what do you got in it? Yep, so from MAA Gunner again, uh, what is the team going to look like with Lacazette back? Uh, I'm assuming he means in Europe. Lacazette in one leg and Welbeck in the other. Uh, um, it's going to be hard. I, I'd imagine... Oh, I don't really want to change the Ozil... I don't know, we discussed that Wilshere... Uh, Mkhitaryan but I'd imagine you'll see Mkhitaryan maybe take Wilshere's position um, well back into the left mid with Lacazette up front or uh, Ozil playing, well, probably Ozil playing the 10, Mkhitaryan on the uh, right, well back on the left maybe uh, maybe Jack I don't know, Jack and Ramsey um, do you have both of them in the team? I don't know. It'd be probably my guess. You got any? Yeah, I'm going to be controversial and say something that probably less than 10% of people will agree with. Lacazette doesn't get back in the team. You, I, for me, you can't look mm. at last night's performance and the, the, the game in Milan, which are the two performances you have to judge Danny on, and think we've got to drop him. Mm. He, was our, he was either our best or second best player in both games. I'm not saying long term that Lacazette's not going to come back in, but the next game is on, I think, the 4th of April or the 5th of April, the next Euro- uh, Europa League game. So assuming Lacazette plays, comes on as a sub, say, on the 1st, which is our next game, 1st of April, it have played 20 to 30 minutes since basically January. And then you want him to start at Moscow when Danny's performed that well? Not for me. Oh, um, I don't but, think he'll start. I think he might come off the bench maybe first couple of games, wouldn't he? So, yeah, so then, yeah, so then for me, the system says the team, look, barring injuries, we never know what's going to happen, especially with international duty. Mm. But for me, with Lacazette coming back in, it makes absolutely no difference to the team for, the, for Moscow. And I think Danny has to play away, and he probably has to play up top to stretch the pitch, especially with uh, aging defenders. As I said, with Lacazette, technically a brilliant footballer, but... He isn't going to stretch the defence. Uh, and even if he does, he doesn't do it as well as Danny. Um, so for me, I think Danny has to play as a nine uh, in Moscow for sure. Uh, and if he does obviously come off the bench, it'll be for Welbeck. I couldn't think where else. I mean, I mean it, oh, that all depends on situation. I mean, yeah. you know what I mean? If we if we need a goal, then you're going to either go two up top or shift Danny left and take off one of the midfielders and put Lacazette up top so that all depends on situation but looking, looking at the start as I said I, I don't think Lacazette comes back in mm-hmm. okay Savvy um, do you st- 
do we still need a defensive midfielder if Shaka or Nani keep playing like this till the end of the season? Should we rest players in the PL for the upcoming Europa ties? Um, if we don't, if we start, I think the season starts on August the ninth or something like that, with no extra midfielders from what we have now, people will be going mental. Uh, so, I mean, we're so reactionary as Arsenal fans. As soon as someone has a bad game. It's, our oh, sell them, they're useless, they've been useless forever. And then someone has a couple of good games, and it's like, oh, problem solved. And then, obviously, they, they will go bad again, and then it's like, oh, problem not solved, let's blame Wenger. Even though them same fans were saying, oh, we're okay with Jack and Elneny, or whoever it may be. Mm. Um, yeah, we, look, I would still argue we need a, a, a defensive midfielder, but as I've said many times, I, I don't think there's one out there that suits Arsenal, because at Arsenal, you have to play both roles. You have to be very good on the ball, uh, as well as a good defensive midfielder. And uh, look, I've I've been saying for a long time. I still think Jack has got it. Um, very rarely does he put both together at the same time. I think he's he's decent defensively, and I think he's decent on the ball. It's just he tends to be one or the other, and never both at the same time. Apart from the last few weeks. Um, so I think Jack could be good enough. I think El Nenny's never going to be anything more than a squad player, a good squad player, but never never anything more. Um, but I know our fans would be going absolutely ballistic if we started the season next season with with no additions in midfield. I just want to add to that, and I haven't got the stats in front of me, but I've seen a tweet today um, mentioning about, have a look at how many minutes Shaka has actually played. Um, and oh, I, was, I think it might have been he started every game for like the last nine months or something. I, I, I can't remember the exact... Figures, so if I've got that wrong, I apologise, but check it out. Um, so he's, they're talking about his fitness level, um, you know, like, so I think for that reason alone, we need, we need, we need backup there. To be honest, I said that, what game was it? I mean, we rested him against Osterlund, but I said that on uh, Sunday when he played against Watford and we didn't play. And obviously Jack and Aaron were both either arrested or injured or whatever. I was surprised that Granite played them because he literally plays every game. And I, again, like that's after before the game, I tweeted very surprising team, and people were saying, "Oh, we're resting players for the Europa League," and I understood that. But it was the choice of players that we rested that, that really surprised me. Because um, you're right with Granite. I mean, I don't know if he started every game for however many months. He, he definitely didn't start against Osterlunds at home, but. I would be very surprised if he's not played the most minutes for us this season. Yeah, sorry, I've just found that tweet. It was by uh, LT LT Arsenal. Uh, Shaka's fitness is sensational. When was the last time he was declared unfit for a match? February the 11th, 2017. So I was way off. Um, but but you know, like that's that's I don't. He didn't go back to how far that was. When was the last time he was declared unfit? February the 11th, 2017. And to be honest, I think that might have been suspension because we played Chelsea around that time and he, I know he was suspended because he got sent off against Burnley in January uh, and then he and it was a three-game ban. So I think that may have even been through, um, through suspension, not injury, off the top of my head. And in saying that, I, look, I can't remember what we bought El Nenny for, but I, I think he's been worth his weight in gold. We've been a little bit criticism critical of him in the past but I think and as you've mentioned before what we bought him for and what he does and what he's happy doing I'm happy to have him he's just yeah I mean I still uh, yeah I mean my my problem with him and it's hard to say this at the moment because he's had a a good few games but for me he's not good enough to be your second choice which is what he is at the moment Mm. Uh, because I mean look God forbid nothing happens but if Xhaka gets a, a bad injury, or say a season-ending injury, which is only six to eight weeks now, would I be comfortable with El Nenny starting every game for the next six to eight weeks? In all honesty, no. And people may argue with that because of the last three games he's had. Mm. But if you'd have asked people that on the 31st of January, I think pretty much everyone would have said no. But as I said, we're quite short-sighted as football fans. And that's not criticism of anyone because I'm, I'm the same. I'm a football fan like everyone else. Mm. But... Um, you've got to be honest with yourself. I don't think we'd really be comfortable with El Nini playing every game for the next six to eight weeks. I mean, yeah, if he keeps up the standard he has for the last three games, but if you look at his career at Arsenal, it tells you that that isn't his standard. He's playing exceptionally well at the moment. Mm-hmm. 
No, we definitely need we definitely need um, backup there for Shaka, or even yeah. or even competition for Shaka. One of the two. Yeah. Um, um, you go. Next question. Yeah. So from Schwinn, who deserted us today, uh, or who I've got sacked off the podcast, depending on who you believe. <laughs> um, I've always found international breaks to be interesting in terms of whether they are good for momentum or not. We don't play our next game till early April, April the first. Uh, has this international break come at a good time or a really bad one? Um, I'm not a fan of international breaks, but I do get it. Um, so uh, I, I hate them. I hate international breaks. Um, it's basically for friendlies of the World Cup. I think that has been changed next year. Um so they're not doing as many. I'm not sure, Tony. Is that the case or something? I remember something about reading something about. Well, rather than doing friendlies, them. they've started something which is called like the International League, or I can't remember what it's called. And you're joining groups. I think England's is Spain and Croatia, off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, so there, there's less games where they're meant to be more competitive, rather than having friendlies where you change the whole team at half time and there's no momentum and no one learns anything. Yeah. So I don't know. I hate I hate international breaks for the fact that I, if, you know my players are out there and they get injured on a on a friendly. I think oh, fuck. Well, that was for nothing. Um, is it good for momentum or not? Look, I, I personally don't think it matters. Uh, for us, we are sixth in the league. Um, we probably need a bit of a break coming into Europa League. That's the that's the competition we're going to start on. Uh, I, you know, um, if we were first in the league or second in the league, it would be bad for momentum. Um, but as we sit at the moment, I I don't think it matters one bit. Tony, um, I think there is times where they can be a momentum killer. Um, I don't think they particularly are at the moment. I think it would have been terrible going into them on the on the back of the three losses we had or four losses we had in a row. I think that would have been horrible for us. Um, at the moment, I don't know. We go into it in, in good spirits, but but not great. It also gives players a bit of a rest uh, because largely, Bar and Abamyang, the same group, have been playing Thursday, Sunday for I think it's the last seven weeks now. Um, so. It gives them a bit of a break. They're only going to play twice in two weeks, pretty much. Um, the training with international sides tends to be more technical than physical because you're not really going to improve someone's fitness levels in the, the five or six training sessions you have with your country. Uh, so, yeah, it gives gives the players a bit of a rest. I actually think it's come... Like, I'd prefer it wasn't here, but if you're asking, is it a good or a bad time, it's it's more good than it is bad, for me, in my opinion. What's the game that was postponed on the 18th of March against Leicester? Uh, so it's not been rescheduled yet, but it's if both teams are out of the cup, it would have been played this weekend, but they're still in the cup. So, oh, okay. um, so uh, it's been postponed to unknown, but it'll be, it'll be a... It will either be... If they go out of the cup, it will be the semi-final weekend, unless we've already got a fixture set scheduled, which I'm not sure, or it'll, it'll be moved to a midweek. Okay. Um, MAA Gunner says, yeah, ignore that. True, yeah, we'll ignore that. We discussed the Dembele. Uh, Glenn Baxter, regular, was going to ask, who do you think we'll draw? But I think it'll probably be announced before the pod, so I hope I'm wrong. But I think it's Atletico. Well, you were wrong, buddy. Um, so brilliant from the boys. We're dormant. He goes on. And Leon going out, obviously, Atletico, strong favourites. Where do you see us in terms of chances of winning the group? Uh, it's a competition, not a group. So we have absolutely no chance of winning the group because we're not in one. Um, in terms of winning the tournament, as I said, I think we're second favourites, um, especially with the draw. I think we were second favourites before the draw, and that won't have changed much after. No one will want to play us over two legs. Even Atletico, the, the last team they'll want to draw is us. Um, as I think it is what it is. You've got to put as Atletico as favourites, and, and we should be second favourites. But football's played on grass and not paper, which is which is an issue. If it was played on if it's played on the paper that it's written on, then Atletico would win it, and we'd lose in the final because they're favourites and we're second favourites. But on any given day, on any given pitch, strange things can happen. 
I just look in Atletico, so they drew Sporting. Um, you think that's a, a, a real easy win for them? Well, I think they might. Look, it's 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 not a pushover. No, I don't think it's a pushover, but I don't think there's many pushovers left during the last day of the European competition. Uh, I think they'll win. I don't think it's a pushover. Hmm. I think they'll win pretty comfortably. They'll win probably by two or three goals on aggregate over the two legs, but... I don't think it's going to be. I mean, they won eight one on aggregate in this game, um, in, like yesterday against Lokomotiv Moscow, and uh, I don't think it'll be at that distance. But yeah, I, I fully expect them to win and win, win pretty comfortably over two legs. It might be a case of sort of a two one or a one away in one leg, and then winning by two goals in the other. But as I said, I'd be surprised if they if they don't go through, and if it's probably by two or three goals. Two of the Red Bull teams are still in. We'd see them. In yeah. Danger. One of them, uh, so Salzburg, not really. I think they'll they get Lazio, I think, but they'll they would, I think they're the one that everyone wanted, probably. Mm. Um, Leipzig, um, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't watch loads of them, but I've never been really impressed. And you look at their results, especially like they're sort of creeping through in these competitions. I know they beat Zenit, who are a good side, but um, they're, they're creeping through, they're not blowing anyone away and I've never seen anything that's made me think wow look at them but Schwinn who sees more of them than me presumably uh, really rates them I don't mm. know if that's just because he can't say their name properly but um, from what he says he, he's worried about us facing them so we'll have to see but no Red Bull Salzburg I'm not worried about at all Salzburg they oh. beat uh, Dortmund didn't they yeah that is that worries me Dortmund. I mean, Dortmund are not the Dortmund they were. They they went out of a Champions League group. They were very close to not even qualifying for the Europa League. Uh, they lost to who was it? whoever came bottom of that group, the mm-hmm. Greek side. I or can't a remember it was. Side. Yeah. Oh, was it like is this uh, Apoel Nicosia? I think it was, uh, and they beat Dortmund. I think Dortmund are just not the side they were. Mm. Mm. Anyway. Um, okay, you got one or? Uh, yeah. Uh, can Aubameyang play now in the Europa League because Dortmund are out? Oh, I don't think he can. No, you can't. Okay, yeah. Uh, you register your squad at the start of the competition. You get to add players in January after the transfer window. Um, but that's, that's it. It's a bit rough that he couldn't play in the bloody league, to be honest, like. I don't even think he played one game for Dortmund, did he? Well, no, Dortmund were in the Champions League and he played every game. He didn't play for them in the Europa League, but because they they were now in the Europa okay. League, the moment they drop out of the Champions League, he is now registered as a Europa League player. Mm. I mean, look, the rules are the rules. I don't mm. really get what... I think people have only bothered arguing about it because it affected us, but it's like, I remember at the time people were saying, what, can we appeal it? But you can't appeal UEFA's own rule to UEFA. It's just stupid. Mm. Mm. Uh, as I said, the rule's the rule. You can argue with it all you want. It's the rule. It's the I don't rule. think it's going to be mm. fair. Because it's, it's like saying, I mean, Dortmund's a bit different because they coming third was a bad result for them. But imagine the teams that done very well to get third in their Champions League. So they, they got into the Europa League. And you could have their star striker scored 10 goals in the group, fired them to third, got them a great result. And then someone buys him and he's not allowed to play in the competition. Uh, and he would be, if you change the rules, he'd be allowed to play against them in the competition that he's basically got them into. The rules are the rules, but um, Giroud, he can play for Chelsea, but yet he played for us in Europa League. He can play for yeah, Chelsea. Yeah, but we were never Champions involved League. in the Champions League. But Dortmund... We were involved in the Champions League. Aubameyang well, played for Dortmund in Champions League. Were they involved in Europa yeah, League? Yeah, but then... Yes, because when they came third in their group in December, which was before they signed him, they are then a Europa League side. Oh, okay, right on. Cool. The draw the draw was done in December as well. I think about the fifth of December. So when they were drawn to play against Red Bull Salzburg, Aubameyang was a Dortmund player. Ah, okay. Well, that's the rule. That's the rule. Um, I've got one here for you. Cosmic Buta. Um, how come we struggle so hard in the Premier League, even with the lower tier teams? But when it comes to Milano, Ty, we were better in in the Ever in the uh, basically Everett. Everett. He means Everett. 
the typo. Okay. Um, defense, midfielder, and attack, which would look even better with Laka or Bamiyang. Do we put it on different tactics, motivation, etc.? I mean, I think we're always going to be better at teams against teams that are actually trying to play against against us rather than stop us from playing, which is what Milan did. They tried to play, and they just weren't, weren't as good as us. Uh, the tempo wasn't as high, um, again, which probably suits us. Um, and you know, I know we won away, but we've obviously spoke about that last week. But, I mean, a home win... Uh, this this tweet says obviously we struggle so hard in the Premier League even against the lower teams. No one lower than third in the league has taken a point off us at home or four. Brighton, not at home. Oh, at home, sorry. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. obviously we discussed the away tie last week and we've had two podcasts since then. So can't really cover that. But in in the home leg, I, I don't know why this is a surprise to anyone. As I said, the Chelsea got a draw against us. Liverpool got a draw against us. United and City beat us. We beat Tottenham and everyone else we've beat. Mm. So winning at home against anyone isn't really a surprise. Yeah, we've got a good good record at home. I just think uh, the only one I can think of is Manchester United, but that no lower team exactly, and that type of game no, didn't no, get a plan. No so. lower team. Look, United. We've lost to the top two, United and City, yep. and then we've drawn against Liverpool, who I think are third, and Chelsea, who are fifth. We've beat fourth and beat everyone else. Mm. Pretty solid, though. Yeah, we've been good at home. Mm. Um, we've actually played well as well. I think that United, barring the city, take out the City game, United we played very well and lost. Um, Liverpool, we were three two up. We led in the game. Chelsea, we led in the game, one uh, nil, and then went two one down and then equalised. So it's not like we've been lucky or fluky at home. We've been very good at home. Just we don't seem to turn up away. When Lacazette comes back, um, Lacazette or Bamiyang, it's going to be a bit of a headache. How do, how do we move forward with this Lacazette or Bamiyang situation? Uh, you play a Bamiyang until Lacazette proves he deserves to be in the team, for me. And then do you run so, two strikers up top? No. Hmm. Uh, is is for you is Lacazette good enough to change our whole system for oh you? absolutely not but I look at the fa- I look at the fact that he's a 50 million dollar striker and I think to myself at some point he's going to be well he's got to prove that he's worth that I suppose but at some point yeah, it's going to be a headache do you make your headache. team worse because you pay, paid a lot of money for someone no absolutely not well then there you go that, uh, that, that's my opinion and again I know a lot of people <clears> will disagree but then a lot of people rate Lacazette a lot higher than I do so Hmm. Okay, I uh, got one for you again. You can have Schwinn's one. It's not a question. Ignore it. Fucking bludger this Schwinn, Louie. Not on the pod, but fucking questions and comments and statements. What's he banging on about anyway? Uh, ignore it. Oh, no. He answered another question. Oh, okay. Um, Salis. Uh, no, let's just go at Starboy 911. I can got that one. Uh, Granite Shacker's last four Arsenal goals have come against AC Milan, Chelsea, Liverpool, and Manchester United. Your 89 million dabbing dancer could never. Bit of a statement. I think he's having a shot at Pogba. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's right. Um, the, the statement's right. Mm. Um and that. Did he not score against Chelsea? I, oh, in the League Cup. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. I was wrecking my brain too. I was thinking Chelsea. I don't remember that one. Yeah, no. No, I mean, he's, he's right. Um, look, we don't judge him on on, um, on goals. But it's, yeah, he scored against good teams. Mm. Maybe that, that's because they are better defensively. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know what it is, but um, I'm, I, 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 it's Jesus, a big call, Look, and I love Shaka, but and I want him to be great. I've, I've said that plenty of times, but to compare him to Popka, um, I have to question uh, Mourinho's tactics or something over there is not right. It's, it's, I don't think he's being used correctly. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on, but yeah, it's just not right. <laughs> 
couldn't care less. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, I'm the same. I don't really want to get into it anyway. Here you go. Uh, so next question is from TJ Bear Five. That's his Twitter app. Uh, who is the most underrated player in the current squad and the most underrated player to ever play for the club? Oh, fuck. I could write down your answer to the, the <clears throat> squad about you even knowing it. Well, the class checker is underrated. I don't know. Do you? <laughs> He's asking your opinion. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I will say Shaka, um, underrated. He's copped a lot of criticism early in the early in the season, so and I'm probably a little bit biased on that answer. Um, so I'll, I'll run with Shaka um, as most underrated um, because I, I don't rate Mustafi. I'm not a fan of Bellerin. Um, El Nenny's coming on his own. Mkhitaryan haven't seen enough of. Um, check. Yeah. Check's check. Uh, who else we got? Wilshire, Ramsey, well, they give, the Ozil, they give what they give every week. Um, Shaq is the one who's always seems to be in the limelight. So, yeah, look, I'll, I'll run with Shaq. And Eva? Uh, Eva. Ah, oh, shit. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> you, you say your yours on the underage current squad. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I know I know my answers to both. I think I don't know this, but I'd imagine this question was asked with leading the answer to be how many, just because of how he played recently. But that wouldn't be my answer. Um, mine would be Danny Welbeck uh, again, just because I don't think people appreciate what he gives. Uh, again, I'm not trying to say he's technically brilliant. I'm not saying he should start for us. But people look at him as some form of joke character when, as I said, defenders will hate playing against him. And what he does give you, he's very good at. Um, it's just annoying that, as I said, he's lacking, he's very lacking in certain areas. But I don't think you'll find barely any Arsenal fans that rate Danny Welbeck. Yeah, I still maintain we wouldn't have won a cup final or a cup semi final without him last year. He t- tormented Bonucci, who for me is in the top three centre backs in the world in both legs. Um, so it shows that there is there's a lot to give there. I mean, obviously finishing isn't one of them, which is the main issue. But so for me, Danny Welbeck um, is the most underrated currently. I saw a tweet last night that said uh, if his name was Daniele Welbeckio, people would rate him a lot higher. Mm. Um, I mean, I don't know how true that is, but it does surprise me that so many people just dismiss him instantly, even in... So for people listening, that we've got like a a group chat with all the people that write on the clock and talk blog and, and they do their articles. And even before the game, the amount of stick Danny was getting from the people in there. And I was thinking, did you not watch the game in Milan? Like, and, and again, every week now we're getting our Eddie should start. And it's like, well, what is it? I know look, Danny's not fashionable and he doesn't, his finishing isn't great, but I don't, Eddie's not showing anything that, anywhere near the level what Danny that Danny shows as I said Danny's just frustrating when he's in front of goal uh, yeah so for me definitely currently it'd be Danny Welbeck uh, ever when I say ever I'm only really going to go I can only really go back to to my time supporting Arsenal which was probably started 94-95 season but three years ago I would have said Gilberto um, because I think he was viciously underrated in that invincible side but because we've not had a defensive midfielder in that time, people go, oh, we've not had one since Gilberto. And he's kind of become rated for sort of eight years after he stopped playing for us or what, however many years it's been. Um, so I, controversially, I would probably say Robert Perez, and I know everyone rated him, but because he played with Burkamp and Henri, like when people mention great players now, it's very rare they mention Robert Perez. And for me, he was unbelievable. I'm not saying he was good at Camp and Omri, but he didn't really get a mention just because of how good them two were. And then obviously he had Vieira in midfield, who was obviously <coughs> colossal. Um, so it was like when, when people think of that team, if you ask them to name three or four players, Robert Pires probably wouldn't be one of them. They'd probably go uh, Burkamp, Omri, Vieira, and probably Sol Campbell. And I think to, to not have Pires in that top four is criminal. Um, so again, people did rate him, but I just think he was probably underrated oh, look I've, I've been thinking about this 
top player ever. And, and you know, the, it's one player that type of stands out to me that I, I think we really miss. Um, and it's a big call to say ever. But I, I'm going to say uh, Olivia Giroud. Um, I think we really, really do miss him. I think he was very underrated. Um, we went out and bought Lacazette. He, you know, he, he, he was all of a sudden, you know, uh, trying to find his starting position in the team. And I always felt that Giroud was, he always give his, 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 his full, his heart. His, he, you know, he was, he was always give his full at Arsenal, you know. Um, and I, I really think we miss him. Uh, a lot of people probably rated Giroud, but there was a lot of sceptical and how many seasons did we see we need a big striker we need a needed need a gun strike go out and sign a big striker uh wenger uh Giroud's not up to it and 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 he probably wasn't but he for me he was he was underrated i think um so yeah i, I mean I, again I, I wouldn't say ever <laughs> but he got he, again he was criminally underrated in my opinion Mm. So uh, look, yeah, I'll, I'll run with Giroud, um, but yeah, that's just as far as my brain thinks at the moment. <laughs> um, okay, where are we up to? Red Fulcrum. Uh, just. No, oh, I just done that. You done the next just one. Ice, uh, real Fulcrum. Uh, re- realistically, is Kashani still our main centre back next season, or are the club already searching for a replacement? I feel like we can't rely on him week in week out anymore. Um, we're looking for defenders. Whether it'll be to replace him short term, long term, yeah, it'll be someone. But whether we bring someone in and they're, the idea is to play alongside Kashani next season or, or alongside Mustafi. Um, Kashani was a weird one because I got there yesterday I was watching the warm-up and he wasn't moving freely at all in the warm-up um, he was running like he was trying to stop himself being hurt like as in he was running in a way that looked awkward but to try and mask a pain um, but then the injury came through contact so you don't know was he actually injured in the warm-up or not but as soon as I got there it said he, he just he warmed up differently um, but then, yeah, I mean, yesterday, if it was a contact injury, which it looks like it was, you can't really judge him on that because if someone's knee you in the hip, you get a dead leg. It doesn't really matter who you are or how injury prone you are or how injury prone you're not. If you get hit in the hip where it's pretty much on bone, there's no there's no fat or muscle protecting your hip. There's not much you can really do about it. So I don't think we can judge it on yesterday, but I, I do probably agree with the question that I don't feel like we can rely on him every uh, anymore. If he's not injured, he's not performing as well as we c- we've come to expect from him. Um, so long term, no, we can't rely on him. Will any defender we sign in the summer be to replace him or, or play alongside him? It's very difficult to know. Um, I would still put him ahead of Mustafi. So if we say, we, just to put a name on it, say we went and signed Manolas, I would imagine that star in two, if everyone was fit and healthy or as fit as they reasonably can be expected to be, I think the starting two would be Kashani and Manolas, not Mustafi. Do but you, a lot of people you, would disagree. Do you worry that um, Chambers, I think he signed a new contract with us, an extension last year, do you, do you worry that he's, you know, and he has been playing a couple of good games, but is he down for that centre-back position? Uh, no, I don't think he is. Um to be honest, a new contract means nothing anymore. It's mm. probably it's just in, it keeps means he still has a value to us rather than a signal with intent, uh, intent to keep him. Uh, see, again, it's a difficult one with him because at the moment he's third choice centre back. If we sign someone, he'll go down to fourth. As a fourth choice centre back, you're not really going to get any minutes. Mm. But it depends. Look, we don't know if we're gonna we're gonna have the same manager. We don't know what system we're gonna play. If we start playing a back three, then this whole conversation becomes pointless because mm. Chambers will then be the first backup or the fourth choice, but first backup, which is not really a bad position to be in at his age. Um, and it wouldn't be whether a centre back comes in and plays instead of Koscielny or Mustafi. It'd be as well as. 
So, I mean, it all depends on what goes on with either whoever the manager is or whatever shape whoever the manager is plays next season. And don't forget, we've got um, who we got out on loan. No, I don't think we've got any centre backs, but we've got uh, Lucas Perez and um, oh, bloody what's his name? It always yeah, Campbell, Joel Campbell. Campbell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, do they fit back in, or do they continue on oh. their their merry way? Yeah, they get waved off with a good luck. Mm. <laughs> uh, so. Okay, I know you'll like this one. From Jonas82, whose Twitter handle is at J-O-V-E-82. Mm-hmm. Why do you think is the reason that most of our players do not fancy a shot from distance and rather pass it sideways? Bar the Jack a goal and Jack with a good effort, I can't think of many other occasions. Tactics or lack of confidence, should we try it more often? Yep, try it more often. Take the gamble. Um, I-, I want Jack to shoot more. When we signed El Nini, I I got you know there was talk about that he's um, he doesn't mind long shot, but somebody said you don't take long shots. Um, where Shaka still has that ability to take them long shots, I, I personally like it. Um, if you can catch the keeper out, why not? I don't know. What else was the question? Uh, no, that was it. Is it a tactics or lack of confidence? Why they don't do it? Ah, oh, I've got no idea. Probably tactics. Wenger's probably said, "Don't I don't want long shots." I don't know. Um. So I mean, what he says is choose the best option, and I'm a fan of that. I mean, look, I think the problem is with us, and obviously I'm sitting at the games. Is someone with a half decent shot gets the ball thirty yards out, be it Jaka, who it tends to be. He gets it and everyone goes, shoot. And then he puts it, I mean, the chances of scoring are probably less than 5%. But then he puts it wide or over and they go, oh, fuck's sake, wasted the ball again. Mm. And it's like, well, you can't, it's like they expect it to rock it in. And if it doesn't, they, they have a go at him or whoever it is. Uh, as I said, it just tends to be him. For me, I have no issue with long shots when it's the best option. But I don't want us to start shooting just just willy-nilly, just, oh, we've got the ball 30 yards out, I could potentially score from here, so let's hit it when you've got either a player wide or a through ball you could slide in or an option alongside you who could drive forward 10 yards and then potentially have a shot. So it is tactics in a way, but he doesn't say don't shoot. He just encourages them to choose the best option. Um, I, I remember when he was at Bolton, Sam Allardyce used to find these players if they shot when there was another option on from, uh, say it was 25 yards, whatever distance was, if they shot from further of that distance when there was a better option on, they used to find them. Um, and I think that's the, the way to go. As I said, the long, the ratio of long shot that goes that goes in, not just for us, for anyone anywhere in the world, is, is very, very low. Mm. So you think of all the chances you could potentially waste where there could be a ball slipped in wide and a cross go in. It's just, as I said, there's nothing wrong with long shots, but... When there's a better option on, you've got to go for that. And we as fans would be the first people to moan if there's a better option on and, and someone skies it. Wouldn't go, oh, at least he took the shot that we've been asking for for weeks. We'd go, oh, it's fucking shit. The, the fullback was in. So for me, it's just about choosing the best option. Mm, okay. Um, Jonas82 asks again, how impressive is El Nenny lately? Uh, solid. We can. Should we consider... Starting him more often, or is he more of a plan B to regain control over the midfield when things are a bit loose? Uh, to be fair, one of our followers, Callum McKay, has answered this with, who would you start him over? And there's been no reply. Maybe Jonas hasn't seen it, but I think that's the key question. I mean, like, I've made my feelings clear that he's he's a second choice at best, maybe a third choice, and he's done very well the last three games. But again, we're being so reactionary. As I said, on January the 31st, if you had said, oh, should we give El Nenny a few games in a row? He would have gotten no chance. You're having a laugh in you. Mm. Um, but he, yeah, he has had a few good games recently, and I'm not taking that away from him. But I don't think two or three good games, especially when one of them, like yesterday, was 20 minutes as a sub, don't don't suddenly mean you should get a run in the team. Um, and again, who'd you start him over? I know look, he started, started against Watford because Jack and Ramsey were both out. But would you want that every week? For me, no. I'd prefer if you gave me an option every week and said, uh, assuming Granite's position is is stuck and Granite's going to start, and you said you can either partner him with Jack Ramsey or El Nenny, 
we can argue all day who would be first and who would be second, but I know for sure how many would be my third choice out of them three. Mm. And I'd imagine, I may be wrong, but I'd imagine the vast majority of fans are the same. That doesn't mean when we next lose, they're not going to blame Wenger for not playing him because they will. But if you ask people now, if, I mean, if I honestly said to you, uh, who's going to play alongside Xhaka, your choice is a, a Ramsey, Jack and El Nenny and put them in an order, what would you say? No, I would be either Ramsey or Jack. El Nenny or yeah. he'd be well, third choice. Yeah, and I'd imagine, as I said, a vast majority, probably 95% of our fans uh, would say the same. But when yeah. we lose, they'll go, oh, should have played El Nenny, we was too, we was too loose at the you'd, back. Or, you'd uh, probably get a couple say um, Niles as well, Mike Niles, before yeah. El Nenny. Well, again, that, that's died down again. Look, that's a, that's a problem with our fans, and probably all fans, but obviously I'm more involved with Arsenal than anyone else. They're so reactionary. A few weeks ago, it was, oh, I never want to see Xhaka play for us again. Niles should be starting every week. I've not heard anything. I've not heard Niles' name mentioned in terms of centre midfield for a good month now. Mm. Where and a month ago, it was like he should be starting. And I'm pretty sure I saw someone tweet he should be our future. He would be our future captain. <laughs> just so we're just so reactionary. It's unbelievable. Mm. Which is ironic because it's the thing that Arsene Wenger gets criticised with probably the most. Just being reactionary rather than proactive. We can't win. Yeah. Um, so, uh, with Pete, which is God's Guna, asked about Monreal, but we covered that earlier when we were talking about the game. So I'm going to skip that one. Yep. Um, so Dom Lloyd said, uh, will Danny Welbeck's recent form allow him to get more game time before the World Cup? Do you reckon he'll go to Russia? He's got a great record for England. Do you want me to answer that? Because uh, yeah, you, you go that one, mate, because I've got nothing to okay. do with England. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I think he will get more game time just by the fact that if we play 4-2-3-1, especially against lesser teams, which all of our games are now, apart from United, uh, in the league anyway, um, we're, not, we're going to be given possession of the ball. So, as I said earlier, I don't think we'll start with the same that the team that's there to wrestle possession of the ball so you're going to look at for a more attacking player on the left and the only two we've got that can play there are Welbeck and Iwobi and for me Welbeck's a million miles ahead of Iwobi so I think he will be getting more game time uh, again this is all injuries allowing um, in just, terms of, just on your England squad sorry because um, I just did think of that is Harry Kane going to be injured uh, I think he'll be back for the World Cup. Obviously, he's missed this squad that got announced yesterday. But that's the, I mean, that's, that's the thing. A lot of people are assuming that Danny Welbeck's in the squad because Harry Kane's out. But he gives something different to pretty much... I mean, maybe he's a bit similar to Vardy. Vardy's better in front of goal. But he gives something different to, to a lot of our strikers. And he, and he can play in other positions rather than just up front. I really wouldn't be surprised to see him go to the World Cup for that reason. And when you look at our strikers... I say are oh, for the English listeners. Um, look, Kane, if it is going to be first choice, and then Vardy's going to go. And then beyond that, Sturridge isn't going to go. Um, looking back at the last major tournament, we had Sturridge, we had Rooney, who's now retired from international football. So unless England only take two strikers, which they're not going to do, they're going to take three or probably four. Unless there's someone I'm missing that I've not thought about, maybe Rashford, but you could class him as a wide player. But even if you don't, we'll, we'll take four strikers. So if you go Kane, Vardy, Rashford, there's still that one place to to fight for, even with um, Kane back in. Theo? Theo Walcott? Theo Walcott? He won't go as a striker, and Southgate's never used him. He's never okay. been in the Southgate squad. Yeah. Um, so for me, I, I can't see a more obvious candidate for that fourth spot than Danny Welbeck um, and again a lot of people will disagree uh, I've seen some people say Glenn Murray but that he's just never going to suit England's style and he, he offers more goals but if it's goals you're looking for we've got players that are better goal scorers what Danny offers that Glenn Welbeck's a very uh, Glenn Welbeck Glenn Murray is very static where Welbeck's very mobile um which is why Glenn Murray will never play for a, never play for England or not in a major tournament. So I can't I can't see a better candidate for that fourth striking role. Um, Did so you say Vardy? Adrian, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I would go Kane and Vardy as the first two, and then Rashford, 
uh, as an option that could play wide. And then, as I said, I can't see anyone anyone else that could be that would go ahead of Danny, really. Who was that, old, who played, was that old boy who got the start up last year? Um, Defoe, was it? Defoe's not been getting in the Bournemouth team. But he's another one that's dropped out since the he's last... dropped out. He, 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 got a big call, he got a call up or something with you guys, didn't he? Yeah, he scored in the qualifier against Lithuania. I was there. Yeah. But he, uh, again, he's another one that's dropped out um, from recent squads that's been in there. So I, I can't yeah. even see any competition for Danny Welbeck for that fourth spot. So yeah. I think if he plays the remaining... No, I mean, uh, what we've got at the moment, 10 games left, uh, including the Europa League. Obviously, it could be stretched to another three if we, if we keep progressing in the Europa League. So say there's 13 games left, being optimistic... I think if Danny plays in seven, eight of them and remains fit, I think he's it's got a good chance. I don't want to say guaranteed, but I think he's very likely to go. Yeah, nice. But again, my opinion. Yeah. Um, but and as uh, Dom Lloyd said, he's got a, a very good record for England, and he offers a lot. His work rate's very good. He defends from the front. It's another thing. If you choose someone like Glenn Murray, you're going to lose. Where he's very static, he's there. He'll win thick ones and stuff, but we're not going to be playing long ball. And he's not going to defend from the front because he's not mobile enough. Okay. Um, so Dom asks another one, but we've pretty much touched on it. But we'll, we'll answer it really quickly because uh, Xhaka is that is my question. Do we still need a big physical Vieira replacement signing in the summer? Also, does he have a footballing brother? Uh, yes, he has a footballing brother. Um, I can't think of his name or where he plays now, but. I can't even think of his position. Uh, same position. Uh, he plays for Albania, where obviously Xhaka plays for um, Switzerland. They're, they're from Kosovo, but they got a choice because Kosovo wasn't a nation at the That's time. That's right. Yeah. They got a choice where to play. Uh, his name begins with T. It's like Tibol or Forsten or something like that. Mm. Um, Tibulan. I don't know why that name's in my head. But yeah, he does have a brother. Yeah. Um, do we need a... Big physical Fiera Vieira replacement signing in the summer. I mean, Vieira in a way was a curse to the club because you're just never going to get anyone like him. He was a freak of nature, six foot four, as athletic as they come, but also brilliant with the ball. Could pass, could tackle, could run. Just had everything. I think no team in the in the history of Premier Leagues had a a player like Vieira apart from Vieira. So when, when people say, oh, we need the new Vieira, well, yeah, so does the rest of the world. Mm. Like, ask anyone that, that, I mean, obviously I've mentioned before that I've been, or I used to be quite close to Joe Cole. And he always says that when he played against Vieira, he knew he was playing against the best midfielder in the world. He always said that. Yeah, well, yeah. So that's, that's what you're looking at. So in terms of a Vieira replacement, though, it's just, I think, as I said, in a way, Vieira is a curse that that's at Arsenal, that's always what you're going to get compared to. But that's not what, and no one's ever going to be that. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, we touched on earlier. Do we need someone else? So I, again, I said earlier, I think Jack is very capable. If he can bring it all together, he's going to be an outstanding player. Um, I, at the start of the season, when we done a, a prediction piece, of all, all of the writers at Clock and Talk, uh, some we've had joined since then. So they didn't do one and others we've had left. So they probably won't own up to what they've done. But when predicting the player of the season, I, I said Xhaka just because I've seen before he has everything. Um, oh, shit, who do I few, I can't remember. Um, but I think Jack had a few good games at the end of last season. Uh, some very good games. He was very good in the cup final. Um, I'd seen he's had everything, and I thought this would be the year he brings it all together. The first six months of the season, he certainly didn't do that. Last few weeks, it's looking like he maybe will, but I'm not going to say because he's had three good games, oh, he's finally learnt to bring it all together. Once he does that for 10, 11 games in a row, then I'll say, OK, that's what I saw. And now he's actually brought it all together. At the moment, he's in a patch of good form. Until he makes this this his normal form, I won't say he's an excellent player, but I think he's very capable of being that. Yeah, I reckon you probably bloody... I reckon I've said Shaka and you've just copied off me. I said it's there <laughs> right. I, uh, what I did say... I can't remember who I said... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said Xhaka is Arsenal Player of the Year, and I said um, Kevin De Bruyne is League Player of the Year. Yeah, um, that'll, that'll go I pretty mean, it's going to be between De Bruyne and Salah for Player of the Year, so I could be right on that one. Mm. Did we have a golden point? Golden uh, golden boot? Uh, probably. probably. Yeah. Okay, you want to ask one? 
Oh, because you can't say his name. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I'm up to. <laughs> okay, so Srinath Murali, oh, yeah. Shri Daguna. Shri Daguna. Um, why do we always seem to have one fourth substitution per game at the least? Also, who do you guys prefer as our third choice centre back? Personally, I like holding better, but Wenger seems to prefer Chambers. Um, I have to disagree. I probably like Chambers as your third choice. Uh, holding, I just, I, I'd almost like Holding to go out on loan for a year. Um, he's, yes, he's he, he's probably got the the ability. Uh, to be a future centre back, but how old is he? No one ain't twenty. Uh, I think twenty two. Oh, he's old. No, okay, twenty two. So, but I, I would like like him to go out on loan for a year. Um, I'd probably like, obviously, in the Premier League somewhere. Um, Chambers for me has been around for a little bit longer. Um, what was the rest of the question? Why do we always seem to have a four substitute per game? No. Oh, that's just that's football, isn't it? What do you do? Um, I don't think he wants it to be forced. Um, yeah, what do you got? Uh, so I, I mean, I'll start off with the substitution. I think that's probably uh, reactionary uh, to yesterday because of Koscielny. I mean, I know Mustafi went off against Watford, but he didn't have to. He could have stayed on. But we're three 0 up. If you if you don't feel hundred percent, just why risk it? But had we already made all three subs, Mustafi would have been more than fine to carry on. Uh, in Milan, I don't think we had a four substitute. Oh, we did that. Kolas- well, again, Kolasinac went off, but he was knackered. Oh, that's again, right. Kolasinac, yeah. That was fit fitness. Enough. Fitness, yeah. Fitness, yeah. Which, I mean, look, you're going to have a four substitution whenever Kolasinac plays if you count that as forced. Because mm. we know he's not got 90 minutes in him. Uh, Chambers went off with cramp. Again, could have carried on if needed be. But when you have available options, why, why play? Even if you're 10% short, why play when there is a better option for the team? I quite like that players are happy to put their hand up and say, you know what, I, I could still play, but there's players sitting on the bench that could give it more because I'm not feeling 100%. I'd rather that than the players. And there, it, there is players that do it battle along through just because they want to be involved in the game. Um, but I, I quite like that we've got players that are willing to come off um, when, when they feel there's someone else in a better position physically. Uh, in terms of the holding chambers... It's a strange one because, for me, I think Holden has a higher maximum. I think if they're both playing at their absolute best, I think Holden is better. But I also think Holden has a lower minimum. Or like he's, if they're both playing at their absolute worst, I think Holden is worse because he tries to play the ball out and he tries to um, move the ball around the striker. So it is a tough one. Chambers how old is Chambers? Uh, 24, 25, I think. Yeah, okay. Um, so for me, it's a tough one because I think Chambers is more consistent. But where Holding, for me, in my opinion, has that higher maximum, do you give him games to try and make that maximum his normal or that higher level his normal? Or do you go with Mr. Consistent? That's a personal preference. Uh it's a tough right now I would go with Chambers just because of what we've well actually it's a difficult one I'm thinking of Europa League if, if we have to play one of them in the Europa League I'd go with Chambers just because you're more likely to get a consistent performance if we were in the final and Koscielny was injured and you could only play one of them and one of them had to come in just for that one game completely out of the cold I would probably go for Holden so it really is just a, 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 a situation of what you like do you prefer someone that can be a 10 out of 10 but is more likely to be a 4? Or do you prefer a guy that is probably an 8 at best and a 6 at worst? Mm. And that's just personal preference. Just fast forward to next season, and I know he's talking about this season, holding chambers for next season. Um, I personally think both of them would go out on loan next season, and we need to rebuild our centre-backs to start from Ch- the Chambers, Chambers won't have another loan. I, don't, I think if he goes, he goes. Right. Because he's had a year out already. You're not going to learn any more from another year out. Um, oh, we got that Greek bloke too. Uh, yeah. What's his name? Mavropanos. Yeah. Um, where's he playing? Well, look, I mean, I've not, I've not seen a single minute of him. 
No, my, my Uber. No. But he's there at the club, and the other two are getting game time, maybe limited, but they're getting game time while he isn't. So mm. you can only assume that at the moment they're better than him. Um, he, I think he's 23, which is, I've just checked the same age as Chambers, holding his younger. So looking at it for me, I mean, he's not included in this debate, but that's it may be a bit unfair because, as I said, I've not seen a single minute of him, but knowing that all three of them are at the club and he's getting the least minutes out of the three or he's got no minutes at all, it, they must see something that, that says he's not ready or he's not good enough. Hopefully it's just he's not ready because he's new to the league, he's new to the country. But uh, for me, he just doesn't come into the debate based on what's being selected at the moment. We, we both know Europa League's our go-to thing. We need to win this tournament. Um the league, though, we're in sixth. We're battling on. Obviously, we should hang on to sixth. The last couple of games, what, ten, ten games to go? Um, is this where we start trying these young blokes? Uh, I don't know. Uh, not, not for me, because you're always building for, for the next system at season and trying to build partnerships. And it's, it's like... I said this a few weeks ago with Aubameyang like people saying oh, rest us all for the Europa League and, and I get that I fully understand that but you want a bed Aubameyang in with the players he's likely to going to be playing in and want them to build relationships so you want him to be playing with Ozil and Mkhitaryan so I know you, you kind of want to rest them for the Europa League which are more important games but then there's no point playing Aubameyang for the, re- the next 10 games with Iwobi Welbeck and don't get me started on well, whoever, whoever it's someone that isn't going to be first team yeah, with him, yeah, no, no. Yeah. so it's difficult because yeah, you but have our, to play team around him but our back line man it's it's like fucking hell we need, it needs replacing like so uh, Klos, uh, Klesinac well we know he hasn't got fucking much minutes in here um, and Kashani Kashani well do we even know he's got another season in him obviously he probably does but at some point, he's got to get that. Uh, I think he's Karen B carrying the Achilles injury all season, so it's probably a good time to go and get that sorted and maybe bring but in. The thing is, they're not going to be. They're not going to be our starting line next season anyway. So it's just playing them for no reason. Like I said, we're going to sign at least one, and then at least one of Kashani or Mustafi will be the other centre back. So playing Holden in Chambers isn't preparing us for anything. Mm. And also, especially as a defender, it's very hard for Mustafi, say, to to not play at all apart from the Europa League. Like just coming in, it doesn't. It's hard enough for it's hard enough in any position. So like, just oh, Mr. Stoke game play against Zenit, Mr. Who have we got? Whoever we've got after that on the eighth, yeah. then, then miss and then play, and then it's just it's not really it's not really feasible. I'm not saying he has to play every week, and there will be times when one of the two play like against Watford holding played and Mustafi played 60 or 70 minutes we'll see more of that but I don't think we'll ever see him go okay Hector might be off and the two centre backs aren't great so we're going to go Niles uh, holding Chambers and a left back as a regular thing I don't think we'll see that we'll see one of them and then maybe two if there's injuries like when Hector was injured against Watford um, Niles came in but I think we'll we'll see one of them. We'll start seeing them get more minutes, but it won't be like a wholesale change. It'll just be one of them trying to get um, them more minutes. Okay, last question uh, from Joe, Uncle Joseph, at Uncle Joseph. Um, if and when Wenger goes, who would you guys want to replace, replace him? Who's who's your ideal candidate? Um, I like Allegri. Uh, who? I, huh? Who did you say? Allegri. Oh. I, I like Allegri. I wouldn't go with Hardin just because it would signal to me that we have intent on being a selling club. Mm. Uh, with Sven and Hardin, both known for getting young talent and selling them on. For me, that's not really what I'm looking for in Arsenal. Uh, <laughs> Ancelotti would be a stopgap. Not wouldn't be a bad choice. I prefer Allegri to Ancelotti. I don't think Conte would be a bad option if Chelsea do get rid of him, which is very much expected. Uh, I mean, Allegri would be my first choice, and I would probably say Conte would be my second if he is available. 
Uh, if he's still at Chelsea, we're not going to go and take him off Chelsea. But I think he will be relieved of his duties very shortly after the season finishes. What and makes you think Allegri is available, though, for Juventus? Is he on the way out, is he? Uh, so he was pretty much... He was in talks last year and would have he would have been our manager had Wenger not signed. He's earning £3 million pounds a year. Uh, it's very easy to turn heads. And especially if they do win the league, like... He just can't really take them any further. It'd be four years in a row he's won the league. Hmm. If they don't win it, it may be a different argument. He may feel like, oh, I'll have to go and get my crown back. But if they do win it, it's sort of, again, it's like, I've won it four years in a row. What what more can I really do with this bunch of players? Hmm. I can go and trip my wages elsewhere in a bigger supported club. No disrespect to Juventus, but most of the British clubs are bigger supported than the, the foreign clubs apart from Real Madrid and Barcelona. So, yeah, I think he'd be available. Um Okay. So yeah, for me, he would be my first choice with Conte as my second. But I know a lot, of, uh, a lot of people wouldn't agree with Conte. Yeah, I'd probably run with. Um... Shit, yeah, yeah, I didn't. I, I never really thought of Allegri because I'd never thought that he'd be available. So that type of really threw a bit of a spanner in the works. Um, I like Conte. Um, I don't think he's happy over there at Chelsea. Uh, I'm with you. So he. I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of Ancelotti. Um, I think maybe one or two season, he, he'd probably come in, clear out some dead wood, uh, maybe sign some good players, make us contenders. But well, you know, where's that type of put us in the future? Um, who's the guy from Monaco? Oh, then. Yeah, I don't I don't mind him, but. I do like what he's done at Monaco. Um, you know, the the I don't know if he's the bloke who spotted Mbe- Mbappe and Lamar and whatnot. I don't know if that was him or not. Um, but uh, to have players of that calibre like an Mbappe and a bloody Lamar and whatnot, and to think that they between him and Zven could do something like that at Arsenal does excite me a little bit. Um, I, you know, like at the end of the day, there's always going to be that big club like a Barcelona or a, or a PSG that are going to come and say, knock it on your door. It doesn't matter what player you got or how good, uh, you know, uh, but they're going to knock on the door and say, we want to buy that player. So I don't think that would mean Arsenal being a selling club, um, as what you said. Um, that that was your reason why you didn't like him, wasn't it? Because you didn't like the way they. Well, I think it would just part. be a developing. It would just be a developing ground for young players. Mm. Mm. But if you win a couple of titles on the way, though, would that worry you? I don't think. I don't think it would work in the Premier League. I think you'd just be doing more for the players than you would be for for the club. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll probably go with Conte. Um, uh, I like Simone, Simone from Atletico Madrid. Yeah, good manager. I don't think he'd be available, which is why I've not yeah, mentioned him. But yeah, I yeah, don't I know if he's available or not. So, yeah, that'd probably be about it. Um, okay, that's it for the questions. Is that all you got? Yeah, I just found the, the piece I was talking about our season predictions at the start of the year, but you must have bottled it because you ain't got, you're not on there. Yeah. So there's me, there's the football mole, um, and then there's two people I have no idea who they are. <laughs> uh, they must have been on clock and talk at some point. But Ram Jackal, <clears throat> whoever that is, at Ram Jackal, mm. and at uh, Tim something. Never. Uh, at underscore Tim PD. They both done them, but no idea who they are. But my ones, I'll embarrass myself now. Uh, see, so everyone that listens to this I thank you for listening to me and I know some people rate my opinion but this just shows how wrong I can be and how you're probably wasting your time listening to me uh, so <laughs> who will win the league I, I said City by miles uh, correct well done me uh, top four I said City, Chelsea, United Arsenal well, that ain't gonna happen uh, PFA player of the year I said De Bruyne probably gonna get it between him and Salah Arsenal player of the year as I mentioned Xhaka um, FA Cup winner 
I said, if Tottenham get to the semis, they'll be favourite because they'll be playing both games at home, the semis and the fi- potential final at home. And that still worries me. They're obviously in the quarterfinals this weekend. Uh, but I said, because that thought's unbearable, let's say Everton, who are obviously shit. Um, who will go down? I said, I don't think Brighton or Huddersfield have done enough to bridge the gap. Brighton certainly have. I, don't, I think Huddersfield probably still will go down. And uh, this, the most embarrassing thing I said is, I really like Sean Dyche, but can't see Burnley have enough goals in them to stay up. They are sitting <laughs> in seventh, a few points behind us. <laughs> so this is the insight you listen to every week. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we'll have to do that next year. I don't yeah, know I mean, why I, I, do I didn't it. do more. I mean, obviously, I don't usually have a platform, but I do it to myself every year. Yeah. Um, it started off a few years ago. Me and my friend, we was going on holiday, me and a mate. And on the plane, we'd done a thing where we listed what we thought the table would finish like. Yep. We'd done a pound per place. So the most you could lose was 20 quid. Yeah. But I think we only got, I think, like, there was four and five, right, between, like, one got four and one got five. So since then, I've started doing it just to show how clueless I really am. We might, uh, yeah, we might do something like that in the off season. We'll get a couple of followers involved as well. We'll put a post up or something and do a yeah, couple of predictions. Shall I, I embarrass the football mole and tell you what his ones were? Yeah, go on. So City to win the league, Chelsea second, United third, Liverpool fourth. Uh, more doable than mine, to be fair. Player of the year, Kevin De Bruyne. I think he copied me. Uh, <laughs> Arsenal player of the year, Xhaka. Uh, he said, I'm a huge fan of Xhaka. I'm expecting big things from him this season. Uh We'll, we'll see him settle down and finally play some brilliant football. Uh, he said Everton will win the FA Cup, Arsenal will win the Europa League, and uh, PSG will win the Champions League. Relegated, he said Brighton, Huddersfield, and Leicester. Leicester? And that's, Fuck. Yeah. It's a big call. Oh, it's wrong call. Yeah. Who did he say Champions League? PSG. Yeah. yeah. He, he's ran down the Neymar path. Yeah, he, he actually said beneath it... Uh, They've, they've shown some real attention and with the signing of Neymar it might be a bold prediction okay there you go uh, we'll definitely do that next year um, okay I think that's about all we've got oh I just wanted to mention and I was just looking for it on Twitter so uh, Tony's got a raffle going you getting some interest there mate uh, to be honest I've not checked the PayPal so I don't know if anyone's entered yet because there's loads of people showing interest at start and I've had loads of questions just about if people can buy the season ticket but that's not what it's about I could, like, I can sell a season ticket 100 times over but I want someone to get a good deal out of it so what I'm doing is I've got a spare season ticket for next year at least one maybe more um, it's £10 to enter the raffle and at the end of the season I'll be doing a raffle and uh, of obviously all the people that have entered and someone could end up getting a season ticket for a tenner. Um, as I said, people have offered me more than what a season ticket's worth, to be honest. But that's not the point in it. As I said, I can easily sell a season ticket. Um, but I'd, I'd like someone to get some good value out of it. Yeah, and a couple of people I did see say scam. I can guarantee you it's not a scam. We're not in it to make money off you people. Uh, it's just something that Tony said that he's happy to do because he's got a couple of season tickets uh, coming in. Also, uh, Tony, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there is a big lineup for these season tickets. Yeah, it's about a ten-year waiting list. That's what someone messaged yesterday and saying, "Oh, can I buy it off you outright?" And I said, "There's, there's, like that. It's all. It would always be. Even if I said, like he said, for a lot of money, can I buy it off you outright?" And I was like, "No matter how much you agreed to pay me, it would always be in my name." Mm. And he was like, "Oh, would not even a lot of money change that?" I was like, "No. The only way to get your a season ticket in your own name is to buy it off the club." which is a 10-year waiting list. Mm, well, I've go. not seen anyone say it was a scam, but if they need proof of any one of about the 10 season tickets I can get, I'll happily show them. Yeah. No, I, I saw him one tweet and I thought, uh, yeah, come on, guys. Um, it's, it's a raffle. It's, it's £10, which is bugger all, and hey, you get the chance of winning a season ticket. And keep in mind, Tony, if you get, for an example, you wrote here, uh, $800 worth of tickets, well, they might pay the 200 difference or something, was it? Yeah, yeah. So look, I'm, I'm being honest. I'm not looking to lose money on it. So if the season ticket is worth, say, a thousand pound, and yeah. only eighty people enter the raffle, so I get eight hundred pounds worth of thing, the winner will have to pay the difference. But I mean, it would still mean getting in that situation. It still mean getting a season ticket for two hundred pound. Mm. So if you sold two or three games, that would cover what you paid, and then the rest of the season ticket would be yours for essentially free. Yep. There you go. So get into it, guys. And uh, look, Tony's there asking some questions. If you need to. 
that look ten pound. I tell you, if I was over there, mate, I'd be I'd be buying a couple of them. And just keep in mind, I, I don't know what thousand pounds these are. <laughs> I seen yeah. somebody say he, he was going to buy a, a heap of tickets. Like, <laughs> just be careful, mate. <laughs> Don't be buying a thousand pounds worth of tickets. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you see that? No. <laughs> no. So anyway, um, what else we got? We're not going to be back for a little bit, are we? We had a couple of no, weeks off. We've got, we got uh, FA Cup this weekend, which obviously we're out of, and then international break next time we're playing is the first of April. So we'll be back after the first of April, um, and Schwinn will be back by then, I'd imagine. Um, that's about all you got, Tony. Yeah, nothing more from me. No, okay, guys. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading, and uh, thank you for your support at Clockend underscore Talk on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, we're also on YouTube. I'll get this one up uh, probably tomorrow on YouTube, but the podcast will go out straight away. Uh, you know, by the time they hear this, it won't be tomorrow. So you don't need to say that. Uh, yep, 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 true. <laughs> okay, guys, <laughs> thank you. Um, look, it's about 2 a.m. in the morning, 3 a.m. in the morning here, so I'm fucking just rattling on. But anyway, thanks, guys, and we'll catch us later.